I'm Joe Sedak, and I was uh, I'm from Colorado originally. In the 82nd, I was initially, I was always assigned to Bravo Company 1st Battalion, 504th Parachute Infantry Regiment. I was initially a uh, squad leader in 3rd Platoon for a couple of years, and then I ended up getting promoted to Platoon Sergeant uh, in November of 89, about a month before the Panama invasion. So they made me a platoon sergeant. Fellow citizens, last night I ordered U.S. military forces to Panama. No president takes such action lightly. This morning, I want to tell you what I did and why I did it. For nearly two years, the United States, the nations of Latin America and the Caribbean, have worked together to resolve the crisis in Panama. The goals of the United States have been to safeguard the lives of Americans, to defend democracy in Panama, to combat drug trafficking, and to protect the integrity of the Panama Canal Treaty. That's kind of where I was at. I was, you know, Ranger qualified, primary jump master, or you know, jump my senior parachutist, I guess, at that point in my life. And, you know, on the flight down there, you know, we'd gone over, you know, operations order and all that kind of stuff. You know, we had aerial photos and uh, maps of the drop zone and everything around it. As a platoon sergeant, I had 38 guys assigned to me. As the Rangers jumped in, the, you know, the crew chief guy calls, tells me to go up and talk to the pilot. So I walk across to everybody's, you know how it is, you know, walk across to everybody, get in the front of the plane, up the cockpit, and the pilot's telling me that uh, Rangers just jumped in, still a lot of small arms fire on the ground. They still had a ZSU 74 or 24 in an aircraft gun that was active. So far, it's just small arms fire and that. That's about the time I realized, this is a real deal. Basically, at that point, the only people with combat experience Grenada. was nobody from Grenada. Um, it was Vietnam, and it was our command, our battalion sergeant major, and our battalion uh, commander. Only ones with combat experience at that point. We were in a peacetime army. Yeah, you know, throughout the '80s, very few people got to go to Grenada. You know, and then subsequently Panama. In, in hindsight, so I stopped and I told my battalion commander. I just told him what the pilots told me. You know, small arms fire, Rangers just jumped in. Small arms fire, a lot of small arms activity. One anti-aircraft gun, one had been taken out and one was still active at that point, you know. And uh, he just sat there like this. I thought, well, he's pretty stoic about it. Guess I better be. <laughs> not sweating it. No. There was a little bit of nervousness, but not like, not frightened. You know, I had only been a platoon sergeant for about a month. Tactically, I, I knew I was competent and, and confident in my abilities. But how was I going to react under fire for the first time and really bring everybody home and get out there and kick ass and do what we're supposed to do? So the aircraft were approaching the drop zone. We're coming in pretty low, about I think they were about 200 feet is what I was told, coming in over the water from the south. Being a jump master, you know that as a jump master in training, you're always the last guy out. You know, well, in a combat jump, you jump where you're cross-loaded at. Now, I knew what the drop zone looked like from aerial photographs and from the map. And I knew that our little rally point was a specific small building uh, just south of the main terminal building. It was like a shed kind of a building. Finally, so this so we get back down here, we're 200 feet. Doors are open, and uh, I remember flying over this, uh, seeing a, a fishing boat with lights on it, and seeing a guy with his hands on his hip looking up, you know. This is two o'clock in the morning. We had night vision goggles, but back then, squad leaders had them, platoon sergeant platoon leaders. Not everybody had them. We all had tracers, we all, you know, everybody had tracer rounds and loaded like that, loaded properly for that. Off in the distance, you can see fires and explosions, you know, C-130s came in and just prepped the hell out of them, you know. And there was some little birds just flying around, and I mean, they were just zipping around. Couldn't, can't see them at all, but you can hear them. I remember being on the ground, ducking, thinking, geez, they're about to take my head up. I don't know how low they were, but it felt like they were like right there, you know. <laughs> and I can see the drop zone now. I, now I can see the runways and I can see the drop zone and trace arounds just 
the Rangers were still in a pretty good fight. I remember looking out thinking, man, this is just like the World War II movies. And I was excited about that, you mm -hmm. know. So I'm watching the trace around, some of them coming up toward the aircraft and thinking, this is fucking cool, <laughs> 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 you know. And uh, we, uh, is, is the, the light comes on, you know, and, and I'm like, you know, go, go, go. And I'm, you know, I see that little building going by my door. It was like the third jumper. I was like, I'm out, cause I ain't walking. Yeah. I know where I need yeah, to be. Yeah. You like, gotta be by the RV. That's yeah. where I need to be by my rally point. I remember jumping out and counting to four and during the count, I could see the tracer rounds in the air. You know, not close to me, but I could, you know, they're, they're definitely shooting in the air. There was no nervousness about it. It was really an excitement. Like I'm getting to do what my grandfather did in World War II, you know. I was counting a four, I get to 4,000 and I go to grab my risers, check my canopy, and I hit the ground. I didn't even get to grab them. I hit the ground and I was like on the ground. And did was, you release your ruck? No, <laughs> no. I, bam, I landed with everything right there. And it was the softest landing I ever had. I landed in a marshy swamp area on some really nice soft grass about this tall. And I just kind of sat down and I was like, that was fucking cool. And then getting my, my weapon out of the 1950 case. And then for that, that instant then, uh, you know, when, when I pulled my weapon out, like in training, you pull it out and you, you, you know, you do your, uh, you put your weapon into operation, immediately go into, into mode. I'll never forget that locking and loading feeling of like, now it's on, you know? And so it probably took me half an hour to get onto the runway, carrying this thing through the swamp. And then of course there's a chain link fence that we had to cut, you know, with our bayonet, you know? And so you gotta fucking unload everything, get your bayonet, get the sheath, put it together and cut chain link, mm. you know? Fortunately right there where, where I was, that there wasn't any, any, any bad guys in, around us. Uh, and I could hear people moving, I'm waiting, to, you know, you're constantly listening, tuned in to, you know, are we hearing English voices, are we hearing anything in Spanish? You know, by the time I got onto the runway, the fight was over on the runway. The little birds are flying around just, I mean, back and forth, and like I said, it felt like they're like right over my head. I'm walking around ducking, thinking these guys are low. Just, no lights, you, can't, you know. There was a couple of small firefights going on in the terminal building still, uh, and those were Rangers, so I knew just let them be and don't get involved and mixed up with that, you know, don't want to get any friendly fire. Uh, so we stayed to our objective, which was just a simple rally point at that point. Go back to the aircraft for a minute. When we jumped, General Steiner, uh, who Lieutenant General Stein was 18th Airborne Corps commander, general, uh, he was the first man out of the first aircraft. We get on the ground, we get into our assembly area, fight's over, now we're just waiting on everybody to get there and so we can go on to our second objective. And I remember thinking by daylight, we still have people jumping in at daylight. And I'm thinking, why the hell are they jumping at this point? Why don't we just land, you know? There's no need to be risking injury, parachuting, if you can air land, we have the airfield secure, mm. you know. Four or five hours after I jumped, you wow. know, they're still jumping. Come Blackhawks are coming in. We got nine nine helicopters to move the battalion to our second objective. As I'm approaching the aircraft, talk to crew chief, he tells me, LZ's hot, real hot. And I look at the the floor of the Blackhawk right in between the, well, right behind where the door gunner would sit or, or stand at that point. Um, right there, there was a shit ton of blood on the floor. And I'm thinking, hmm, okay, it's hot. Still not quite knowing what that's gonna be like, you know. So we get on the helicopter and we're flying in. We start taking fire. I remember there's an old building that was 
a two-story building with a long balcony. And I remember seeing a guy running on that balcony shooting his AK-47 at us as we're flying. And as soon as I did, like, door gunner opened up. And he's like right here. Brass is hitting me, you know, going out the door, hitting me, loud as shit. Everybody on my side is like, just letting this guy, you know, by the time, you know, they, everybody shot a magazine on this one guy before we even, you know, we flying so fast, you know, nobody hit that fucker, you yeah, know, yeah, he was yeah. so, going so fast, but, you know, but I remember hearing bullets coming into the aircraft, mm. you know, and not hitting anybody, just miraculously. Wow. But in combat and, and training, you know, we're doing even basic battle drills, we never used earplugs, you can't hear. The first company that went in basically stirred the hornet's nest. And we landed at the bottom of this hill uh, called Tinahitas. And it was, a, it was the first Tiger Company, is what they were called from the PDF, Panamanian Defense Forces. They were on the top, their bar barracks was on the top. Dignity Battalion, Noriega's Dignity Battalion, which was his special operations, mm -hmm. guys were scattered throughout the villages and, and towns. It's like complete chaos. The bullets have, I mean, we are under heavy fire from both, dire all directions. They come down to a hover and the grass is, you know, blowing, thinking we're about three, four feet off the grass. When you jump out and all of a sudden you got time to go like this, you know, like, whoa. <laughs> you know, I'm surprised nobody had any broken ankles or legs because it was a hard jump. So you land in this stuff and it's, you know, blowed out now a little bit. So all you can see is helmets as you're trying to move through this stuff or if you're close enough to somebody. I mean, there's bullets coming through that grass and over us cracking in every direction. You can't see the enemy. You don't know where the hell they're at. You can't know, you don't know where to fire. You can't return fire because you don't know where to shoot. And about that point, we realized that we failed to look at the contour intervals on our maps when we left Fort Bragg. But it was a much steeper, taller hill than we thought. I mean, it was like, holy shit. I don't know, a thousand foot climb. And so I'm just shouting at him, get down, get down, get down, get down. Pull security, fucking pull security. Let us look, let us do our map yeah. check and we'll, we'll be moving out. You know, I'm telling my squad leaders, get your shit together, get your people together, be ready to move. Once we start up the hill and we get up above the grass, now, now we're sitting ducks. I mean, there's bullets hitting all around us. I mean, you know, and I remember the first casualty was Dave's early on, you know, I just told him to get down, you know, he got shot in the head. We are able to return fire to the front, not much, because you just couldn't see anything, you know, couldn't see where it was coming from. But as we get a little higher, now we can start to see some of the village buildings around us where they're shooting from. That What had happened is the PDF and the Dingbat, Dignity Battalion, we call them Dingbats, the Dingbats were, they'd go into people's houses and just, either execute them or, or tell them to get out of the house. And they'd cut a hole in the roof and put mortar tubes in people's living rooms. And they're launching mortars at us. So we got mortar rounds dropping all around us, you know, and you'd hear the thump. And after a while, you start to realize, okay, start counting, you know, we, we need flight time, you know. You count, you count and you hear that thump and you'd go 1,000, 2,000, and you're still moving. All right, five, I better get down. This is about to land. You get drop down, boom, get back up. You hear thud, it's like, keep counting. All the way up the hill was doing that. We got people dying of thirst, dropping out like flies for heat casualties. Some of us have been on the ground for six hours, eight hours, and two, two quarts of water, that's it. Everybody's out of water now. We've been in this firefight for about an hour and a half. Nobody's got water, but in our, Butt packs, we all carried our own IV bags. And so we're not even a third of the way up the hill, and people are grabbing them water, them damn IV bags, and cutting them off and drinking it. Straight saline, drinking it. Now we just want to fight and get up there and take that hill because there's a barracks up there and we can we need the fucking water. Security. First thing we do, we get up there, we got we, we establish security, redistribute ammo. So the rounds are hitting the building. Mortar rounds are coming in. Them rounds were hit, that, some of that mortar rounds hit that building like right behind us, like this far away from me, you know, from people, you know. 
and miraculously nobody got hit. Spend the night up there, uh, mortar rounds kind of start diminishing through the night. Machine gun fire, automatic fires diminish throughout the night. Next morning we send the first patrol down the hill to go into the village and, 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 and go do something with a secondary mission of go through the LZ and pick up any sensitive items that were dropped or lost. Uh, as they're going through the elephant grass, they see a body walk up and uh, there's Denson. And they roll him over and it's Denson. He's all bloated up by this time, you know, 24 hours later. Blew everybody's mind. Those guys, they're like, how did this happen? Can't imagine the shock coming up on one of your buddies. We're thinking by this point, he's in Fort Sam Houston, Texas at a hospital, you know, sitting somewhere with his leg up on a on, on a splint and uh, watching this on the on the news, you know, and that wasn't the case. So they radio up and send another squad down to carry Denson up the hill. You know, something I learned in Ranger School, I'll tell you what the big, biggest thing I pull out of Ranger School, once you're in the tab, it's just begun. Now you have to live up to it. That's what I learned, you know. You gotta live it up now. You gotta lead by example.